Tutankhamun was one of the last kings of the 18th dynasty, and everything about his life, death, and remarkable tomb is ultimately a reflection of that dynasty. Originally, I planned to make a series of longer videos about the 18th dynasty, but for the most part, I'm just trying to impart some historical knowledge and a bit of context. So instead, I'm just going to split it up into a series of smaller videos covering each king of the dynasty, and hopefully you'll see how events build up towards the end. Now, uh, dynasty is a word with a counterintuitive meaning when discussing Egyptology. Amos I, the founder of the 18th dynasty, didn't create the dynasty out of nothing, he's the brother of the last ruler of the previous dynasty, and is only considered the ruler of a new dynasty because Manetho decided that the end of the Hyksos rule warranted a new historical period. Manetho wrote his History of Egypt, the Aegyptiarcha, a thousand years after the 18th dynasty, meaning he was about as far away from that as I am from the Battle of Hastings. Oh, it's been a while. Mirroring the first pharaoh, Nama, Amos led a conquest of the north of the country, a reconquest to be more specific begun by his father. This reconquest took around 30 years. By the time Amos would come into his crown at the age of about 10, the southern kingdom ruled from the city of Waset, or Thebes, was strong and united, and ready for its great push north. It took four invasions of the Hyksos capital, Avaris, to bring victory and the Hyksos would be defeated not in Egypt, but Gaza, and after being ruler of the Upper Nile for just less than 20 years, Amos was at last the Lord of the Two Lands, the first Egyptian to successfully claim that title in over a century. Amos's military efforts had apparently gained momentum, for he not only reconquered the Lower Nile, but continued both north and south, campaigning in Nubia and Syria. It should be noted that Amos didn't sweep through Canaan as a conqueror, so much as an avenger, intent not on subjugating the Hyksos, but crushing them. Later pharaohs would colonise these parts of the world, but Amos only destroyed, seeking to ensure that the Hyksos would never gather enough might to return to Egypt as anything other than subjects. This in itself is quite interesting, I think. After Egypt had been ruled by the Hyksos for generations, and impoverished by civil war, Amos clearly had the option of conquering Canaan and making it a vassal, bringing in much-needed sustained tribute for the domestic coffers. Instead, as when Rome salted the fields of Carthage, he crushed the Hyksos in an act of genocidal national catharsis. In Nubia, south of Egypt, Amos triumphed and the tribute began to flow. In the remaining years of his reign, Amos turned his attention to gratitude, both political and religious. He installed loyal nobles in important stations, and ensured that Egypt's gods were properly honoured through the construction of monuments and the sponsorship of the arts. We know a lot about the 18th dynasty in part because in Amos's reign, Egypt began to churn out records and reports. A bustling civil service led to a boom in literacy and an explosion of the scribal class. This will be important later on in the dynasty, when we get a really good look at how Egypt conducted its political affairs. Thebes was a great strategic choice for a capital, since it was fairly central to the northern and southern frontiers of the country, but perhaps the most interesting change was the religious one. With the supremacy of Thebes came the supremacy of its local god, Amun who came to eclipse the importance of the sun god Ra. Amun was credited with giving Amos the divine thumbs up and guiding him to victory against the Hyksos, and no doubt the Amun priesthood was delighted that their local king became lord of all. Remember those Amun priests, because they and their successors will be returning to the forefront of the story later. Before we say goodbye to Amos, we should note that as well as reconquering Egypt and thus echoing Nama, Amos would echo the glory days one final time. His death was memorialised by a pyramid, the last ever pyramid built to be part of a funerary complex. I say memorialised because he wasn't buried there, and in fact there was no internal structure to the pyramid at all. It appears to have been a limestone casing filled with sand and rubble before the casing was appropriated in later ages for other projects. This cultural change is particularly notable. Although the Theban god Amun was soon identified with Ra, the burial of a king was no longer a rite dedicated to and overseen by Ra. Consider that Ra is the bright and unavoidable sun, and the very name Amun means hidden. The kings under Amun, therefore, rather than placing their mortal remains and worldly wealth in vast skyward monuments, hid themselves and their grave goods in secret man-made caverns. The reason that so many treasures have been unearthed from the Valley of the Kings is in part because the tombs themselves were secret. The public mortuary temples would be nowhere near the kings themselves. 
This wasn't foolproof, of course, and many tombs were in fact plundered, both in antiquity and throughout the Middle Ages and modern day, including that of Armos, who had his nose posthumously broken into the bargain. We don't know exactly where Armos was buried, we're not even 100% sure that he was buried in the Valley of the Kings, but it was very likely the ancient necropolis at Dra Abu El Naga, where his brother Carmos's tomb was found. This is a necropolis dating back to the Middle Kingdom, and saw continual use well into the Coptic period, with non-royal burials. Either way, Armos's mummy was found among the cache of royal mummies at Deir el Bahri, having been moved there much later, presumably so that renovations could take place at his actual tomb. Thanks for watching. Normally I don't do whole series like this one after the other, but I'm moving house and that'll mean some disruption for a few weeks, and that means making videos in advance, and that's easier when they're all part of the same series. The gleeful high priests hoping to benefit from my recognition are my backers at patreon.com slash armchairegypt. If any of you have been considering joining this August community, well, moving month is as good a time as any, and every little helps. Until next time, my fellow armchair Egyptologists, life, prosperity, and health to you all. Thanks for watching. Head over to my channel for more, or click here to see what the YouTube demons think you should watch next. I hope you'll consider subscribing. If you'd like to support and collaborate on the channel with me, go to patreon.com slash armchair Egypt. You can also join my Discord community, there's an invite link in the description.